tell me when it's okay to stop. Is it okay to start? Are we okay? One minute, please. Sure. <clears throat> Laurence, can you stop sharing, please? We will start. Good morning. The session everybody. is open. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, all the participants and all the uh, viewers who are viewing now, not, not us live now in um, Facebook and uh, live stream. My name is Anastasia Nespetalova. I'm head of uh, Macroeconomic and Development Policies Unit here at Anktad in Geneva, and I'm delighted to be chairing and moderating this event today. Um, it's a high profile uh, conversation between very distinguished speakers on a very topical um, issue of digital transformation for development. <clears throat> Let me extend a very warm well welcome to all the participants and our distinguished panelists. There's been a slight change to the composition of the panel because His Excellency the Minister um, of Indonesia is still in, in parliamentary debate and we are delighted to be joined by Her Excellency Mrs. Amelia, um, um, sorry, Mrs. Amelia Adininga, Vida Sati, who is a Deputy Minister of Economic and National Development Planning of Indonesia. Um, other panelists are His Excellency Mr. Namal Rajapaska, who is a State Minister for Digital Technology and Enterprise Development of Sri Lanka, and His Excellency Sri Rajiv Chad Chadra Senka, Mr. Minister of State in the Ministry of Electronics and um, Information Technology in India. Um, this pre-event uh, is um, a pre-session to UNCTAS 15. It's been organized by Unit of Economic Cooperation and Integration among Developing Countries, also known as the South-South Unit here at UNCTAD in GDS, in partnership with ICTA Sri Lanka and INDEF um, Indonesia. Our main objective today is to share successful digital transformation and policy experiences between uh, countries and to enable dialogue on how to constructively go forward. I am now very pleased to invite our acting Secretary General, Mr. Um, Mrs. Durant, to give welcome and introductory remarks to the panel, after which we will hear from ministers directly and there will be a Q&A session. Isabel. Thank you, Anastasia, and uh, good morning, uh, everyone. I'm really uh, uh, happy to be with you, and I would like to extend a warm welcome to our distinguished panel and all participants. We are really delighted to have this webinar, as it was just mentioned, to share good, interesting experience uh, on South-South level. So we know all that COVID-19 has triggered a game-changing moment in which businesses and consumers have increasingly gone digital. But the pandemic has also exposed glaring disparities between the haves and the have-nots, with almost half of the world still offline. According to ITU in developed countries, 87% uh, of the population has internet access. While in developing countries, this number stands at only 44%. And in many of the poorest countries, that number is less than 10%. This is a real danger that those without internet access or without digital literacy are of course left further behind. So in addition, the digital divide is not gender neutral. And this gap is likely widening, although many women entrepreneurs have demonstrated their ability to start, maintain or develop digital activities in the critical period, the gap is nevertheless uh, uh, important. Despite the uh, uneven access, a lot of uh, digital activities in developing world have offered solution to the disruptions related to the lockdown. This has the, uh, been the case in various fields, such as linking sm small hold farmers to more lucrative formal urban commercial markets or linking directly consumers and producers. Countries with strong digital infrastructure have been able to manage the crisis differently and benefit from it. This brings to the forefront the urgency of digital transformation. 
developing countries need to take uh, advantage of the new technological paradigm to create economies that could offer their people better paid jobs. To make technology a force for good and sustainable development for all countries, we at UNCTAD argue that equity should be the moral compass guiding innovation. But equitable outcomes are only possible with the right policy choice and governments uh, from governments and technologists and the, the, the extent to which inclusive innovation approach are adopted. Digital transformation can provide opportunities to countries, not just to recover faster, but to recover differently from the pandemic. And doing so will involve going beyond building connectivity, even if of course it's key, especially in remote areas. There is also a need to build broadband infrastructure, data infrastructure, software <clears throat> infrastructure, digital literacy at all levels, citizens, businesses, even public authorities, research and development, but also interministerial coordination of action and reform in the field of digitalization. Demand and supply side constraints need to be addressed. UNCTAD has been providing research, advocacy, and technical support on these issues to many countries. Our publications and technical assistance have highlighted the implications of rising digitalization for development at national level for national digital transformation policies. We have examined the related challenges for developing and le least developed countries and proposed ways forward, especially in our digital economy report and the trade and development report series. In fact, our next digital economy report, which will be published at the end of this month, focus on digital data and argues that should be harnessed as a global public good. A critical tool for assistance has been the e-readiness assessment. This tool supports developing countries to prepare their digital strategy and design digital transformation policies. And we have conducted such studies for 27 countries, 25 of which are LDCs. UNCTAD also worked with partners in Latin America and Africa in countries as diverse as Colombia, Egypt, and Mauritius in designing their digital transformation policies to help create an effective industry 4.0 ecosystem. These policies aim at improving both the policy measures and the governance structure and are developed following a detailed assessment on, of the digitalization strategies in place and the main challenges faced by the country. In small island developing states, advancements of digital technology and innovative business model can promote their economic diversification and enhance their economic resilience to respond better future shocks. And UNCTAD has recently launched a project in Barbados on economic diversification and resilience in which digital transformation forms an important dimension. We have also proposed several paths for South-South cooperation, such as South-South Digital Cooperation Agenda for Industrialization and Regional Integration. Through our project on South-South integration and the SDGs, UNCTAD has shared successfully exp policy experience of China in five areas, namely macroeconomic and finance, industrial policy, trade policy, digital policy, and debt sustainability, with three pilot countries, Ethiopia, Indonesia, and Sri Lanka. While successful policy experience of countries like China can, of course, not be simply replicated, they can provide important lessons for designing and implementing successful digital policy in other developing countries. So we are really happy that today we have ministers from India, Indonesia, and Sri Lanka to share their key, poli their key policies for digital transformation, particularly focused on building data infrastructure and boost boosting digital innovation. The policy experience of these countries can provide important forward, ways forward for other developing countries in the transformation or digital transformation process. Finally, and to conclude, our responsibility is to mobilize the international community to have an inclusive global dialogue on all aspects of fast technological change and its impact on society, including addressing ethical and normative dimensions. 
The problem is that all countries are affected by technological change and digitalization, but not all have an equal voice, an equal equipment, an equal preparation in ensuring this change will ultimately be a game changer for their people lives. So with this webinar, we want to contribute to giving more voice to the South South uh, Corporation and to the South. So I'm really uh, delighted to listen to your experience and uh, I hope that it will be useful for all of us. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Isabel. Um, this was not only useful, but also encouraging. I think I'm now handing it to the panel. Uh, to Her Excellency Mrs. Amelia uh, Vidasanti, who is our first speaker to open the conversation. You each will have about 12 to 15 minutes to speak, and then I will open the floor for questions and answers. Is it okay? Yes. Thank you, Thank you very much, Anastasia. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to uh, represent my minister uh, on behalf of my minister i would like to share my minister's presentation slides uh, on what uh, indonesian experiences in making the digital transformation uh, in indonesia uh, next slide Today, uh, I'll be sharing Indonesia's experiences in designing and implementing the policies to support economic and digital transformation in Indonesia. Uh, then the presentation will be divided into three main parts. Uh, and then I would like to start with this, the, the slide number three. Indonesia has actually a national development uh, term plan covering five-year period in all development aspects, such as uh, economic infrastructure, human capital, and also digital transformation. If you look at uh, this slide, uh, the development theme of uh, Indonesia in these five years is a prosperous, just, and sustainable Indonesia with medium-high income. And if you look at one of our major projects within these five years, one of them is ICT infrastructure and also digital transformation. So this is actually our effort, especially during uh, the lessons from COVID-19 pandemic, that we need to optimize the role of digital technology and digital economy in increasing the nation's competitiveness and the source of Indonesia's future economic growth. Next. So this is actually the, the framework of Indonesia's digital transformation uh, for 2020 to 2024. Uh, so the digital transformation framework in Indonesia consisted of three pillars. The first pillar is provision of ICT infrastructure. Uh, there in this pillar, it is focused on improvement in information service reliability and speed through expansion of fixed broadband and mobile broadband network, optimization of frequency spectrum, development of intra-government network, migration from analog to digital broadcasting, as well as promotion of passive sharing infrastructure development and revitalization of facilities and infrastructure for uh, public broadcasting institution. The second pillar is uh, how Indonesia can utilize the digital infrastructure optimally. So we call it the second pillar is digital utilization. Expansion of ICT infrastructure utilization for digitizing all development sectors and uh, economic sectors, especially for government, public services, social assistance, education, health, as well as trade and industry and other economic activities. And the third pillar is strengthening of enablers, such as upgrading the capacity of domestic ICT industries and human resources. We realize that to utilize the digital infrastructure optimally, then the most important part is actually that we need to improve the skill of our human resources. And then therefore we have to upgrade the people's digital literacy and skills in understanding and using not only the information, 
uh, but also the digital technology itself. So uh, the enablers that we have to strengthen also adoption of global technology utilization and also strengthening of cybersecurity and resilience. So we have a target in 2024 that by 2024, 95% uh, of villages will be covered by the mobile broad broadband infrastructure. And also 80% of the population will be covered by digital transmission. And we will have, we are also uh, would like to achieve, there will be another three new startup unicorn from Indonesia. Now we have five uh, unicorn startup uh, for, from Indonesia. Next slide. Next. So this is the Palaparing, uh, we call it Palaparing Support Expansion ICT Services. Uh, if you look at this one, uh, how we have three palaparings, and uh, uh, the first one covered 33% of Indonesian region, the second one 50, 15%, and the third palaparing is actually covered 23.16%, and then uh, uh, available use is uh, 504 gigabps. Uh, and uh, already been used for 116 gigabytes per second. Next slide. Uh, nevertheless, the access of digital infrastructure is still an issue for Indonesia. To date, there are around 65% of sub-district and only 86% of villages in Indonesia that have not yet been covered by fiber optic network. Meanwhile, only 55% of villages categorized as the most disadvantaged villages. And then uh, among 500,000 public facilities in Indonesia, including schools, government offices, health facilities, and military, only 150,000 of them have not yet been covered by internet network. So meaning that from 500,000 public facilities, uh, there, there are still 150,000 of them not yet have been covered by the internet network. To respond to this issue, the government of Indonesia undertakes a national program to expand digital infrastructure access, or we call it last mile, last mile program to reach all of the villages and rural areas in Indonesia. This is conducted through the construction of fiber optic network, base transceiver stations, and satellite services. This program is supported by government budget uh, and also uh, supported by private sector for the other region. Uh, next slide. In this slide, next. Uh, in 2018, President of the Republic of Indonesia launched a national campaign of making Indonesia 4.0. The launching marks the course that Indonesia will implement to advance the six priority industrial sectors. That this priority industrial sectors is a priority to adopt the industry 4.0 to improve the competitiveness of that industrial sector. Those sectors are food and beverages, textile and apparels, electronics, automotive, chemical and pharmaceuticals, and medical de devices. It is very important, a milestone for Indonesia, especially to start promoting digital innovation. Making Indonesia 4.0 uh, includes 10 priority initiatives in it, which are further elaborated in the form of a roadmap. So we will we have had a roadmap of making Indonesia 4.0 that include 10 priority initiatives. Next, the government of Indonesia also carries out a national research and innovation transformation to strengthen knowledge and innovation ecosystem to improve quality research and development as well as to develop research powerhouse and promote priority science, technology, and innovation for sustainable development. Next slide. 
There are also several examples of how the government of Indonesia promotes digital innovation in Indonesia. The Indonesian Ministry of Communication and Information, for example, conducts digital technopreneur development program, which consists of uh, in uh, ignition workshop, hack sprint, boot camp, and incubation phases that aims to improve entrepreneurial mindset, basic skills that needed to create a digital startup and advance skills to prototyping a product as well as uh, to prepare a product launch and to become a digital startup. Next slide. To improve digital literacy and skills development among Indonesians, digital literacy and digital talent scholarship program are also launched. The digital talent scholarship specifically targets Indonesian young workforces public and civil servants to improve their skills in ICT. Another complementary program is aiming at fostering a knowledge diffusion through open innovation and open science initiatives and promote open government data to stimulate innovation across the economy. The last example refers to the Indonesian Financial Service Authority that encourages policy experimentation and new business models across sectors, including uh, agile regulation and flexible application or enforcement of regulation. We call it regulatory sandboxes, while we also concern with protecting consumers. This regulatory sandbox allows digital financial technology company to create new business model and allow some stages to finally get approval or licenses. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the government of Indonesia recognizes the important role of startup as the main driver of digital innovation in Indonesia. The vibrant startup landscape in Indonesia reflects creativity in finding solutions to many development challenges as well as responding to growing and diversified market demand. This digital startup covers various types of market needs, including financial technology, online travel agents, payment systems, uh, on-demand services, internet of things, digital wellness services, and e-commerce. They also shape the landscape of Indonesia's digital economy that is predicted to achieve 133 billion US dollar in value by 2025. Six of the startups of Indonesia now are among the global unicorns. Last slide, what we believe now that we need to develop wider collaboration among stakeholders to promote digital skills culture, ethics, and safety, which become the main pillar of Indonesia digital transformation. The outcome would be society, economy, and government that are capable in adopting digitalization and increasing innovation. So last, uh, what I would like to say before I close my, my, my remark, uh, I would like to thank for Antad for this event. And Indonesia is ready to collaborate with Antad because we believe that uh, we are still facing some challenges to optimize the, the role of digital technology and digital economy in our country. And we are thinking to have a closer collaboration with Antet. And we think that we can have some uh, uh, joint work on how Indonesia can provide a better policy for economic 4.0. So this is not only uh, about how industry 4.0, but we believe that the digital technology can be uh, utilized uh, and can create advantages to create Indonesian economy 4.0. Thank you, and I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amelia. Right on time and extremely insightful. Um, please stay on for questions, which will be after um, everybody speaks. 
I now hand the floor to His Excellency Mr. Namal Rajapaksa, who is the State Minister for Digital Technology and Enterprise Development of Sri Lanka, to share his country's experiences. Thank you very much, Aibuan. It gives me a great pleasure to be among you today at this forum focused on the apt theme of sharing of policy experience for digital transformation at a juncture where Sri Lanka itself is actively engaging and setting in motion our own national digital transformation strategy. I firmly believe that well-articulated digital transformation would be key to addressing the global phenomenon of digital divide, which has been highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And we intend would have to have sustainable and focused measures in place in addressing the same. In this light, we have set in a motion a well articulated strategy focusing on key pillars of digital transformation that would enable us to realize a truly digital inclusive Sri Lanka. With the key component that make up the concept of digital inclusivity, being digital skills, connectivity, and accessibility. Sri Lanka has already commenced the Gamata Sannivedane or connectivity to the village, a national program through the Telecommunication Regulation Commission, aligned with the International Telecommunication Union Connect 2030 agenda in ensuring connectivity and infrastructure enablement for rural areas, with, which continues to provide accessibility to non-served and undeserved areas, which is progressing rapidly. With the project, the government has affirmed its intent by recognizing the project on national scale. Through the 2021 budget and the project that project the government is invested, investing on the rural connectivity infrastructure as part of the universal service obligation concept. Today, the Gamara San Sanvedene project continues to expand rapidly. Already expansion plan has been intent intended with the ambitious target of initiating the project in 10 districts by the end of the year. And many areas have already been introduced, 4G connectivity in these districts and continue to be converted as of when the infrastructure comes alive. Furthermore, in addition to the infrastructure enablement on island-wide broadband coverage, the TRC intent with the telecommunication industry has made all access free of any data charge for the official e-learning platform eTaxela of all governmental schools, as well as e-learning platform of state universities, which has been implemented since April 2020. I believe that this is a significant milestone we have achieved in terms of ext extending the concept of free education to digital driven online distance education methodology, as well as we all step in contributing to reducing the digital divide. In this situation, I believe we have been compelled to embrace online education due to the pandemic. In terms of afford affordability of broadband, we continue to make policy decisions that would enable more and more affordable services. In fact, as per the latest ITU global benchmark report, Sri Lanka has made it to the top 20 countries for most affordable internet rates and the top 10 in terms of voice service. The significant a positive indicator to effectiveness of our policies. And we intend to continue to improve on this in the indice. Improving digital literacy skills, yet another key aspect we are prioritizing on. And we are focusing on driving across a multi multinational national wide program across all districts, out of which some are in fact driven by ICTA to ensure we have a well orchestrated strategy in scaling up the digital literacy skills that would enable a meaningful inclusion of all audience in gaining the best of digital transformation drive we are rolling out. We need to continue to educate and advocate to the public on the importance of digital transformation and benefit of digital education, especially during the pandemic. For example, 
Digital education in Sri Lanka, even though at early stage is growing at a rapid rate, due to the pandemic, the school system has had to embrace online education, which they were reluctant to do before. And now it is one of the fastest growing sectors in the country based on the initiatives we have taken to explain before. Furthermore, in terms of infrastructure enablement, we continue to take pragmatic policy and strategic decisions. And to note that few, the envisioned plan of setting up an ecosystem of technology parks, which is currently being initiated as we speak, and the introduction of our, a very own data center networks driven by the te telecommunication industry is poised to place Sri Lanka as a regional technology and innovation hub. In terms of creating digital enabled citizen centric government, the digital government initiatives are another priority focus for us. We continue to focus on ensuring the role of our rapid implementation, special, specifically focus on digital enable, enabling citizen service and projects such as digitalization of the local government bodies, Graman Radari network and automation of government sector entitled including the rollout of digital signature and e-payment. We are now in process as part of a well-defined digital roadmap. We are also focusing on ensuring we bring up to the speed key legislative aspects that are imperative to support the rapid digital transformation and national data protection act and cyber security act which are the final stage of formalization as we believe it is important to ensure a sustainable and robust digital environment for all of us under the leadership of his excellency the president it is by now evident that key priorities and focus our government is to actively working towards digitally inclusive sri lanka while digital transformation is certain, it could be further accelerated by collaboration by all of us. The government, civil society, and the private sector must work together to ensure that digital technologies benefit not only the economy, but society and the environment and have inclusion at their heart. Only then do we stand a chance of realizing the true transformation potential of digitalization to accelerate progress on sustainable development goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Um, this was wonderful and on time. I now hand the floor to His Excellency Sri Rajiv uh, Chandra Sakka, who is a Minister for State, Electronics and Information Technology of India. You also have uh, up to 15 minutes. Thank you. Would you please unmute yourself? Thank you. Good morning and namaskar from uh, New Delhi. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, conversation today, uh, which is, I understand, a pre-event to the uh, October program that will deal with inequality and vulnerability uh, and prosperity for all. So thank you for having me uh, this morning. India's experience in the technology space has been, uh, for many, many years, uh, reasonably well known around the world, driven by the private sector, and, uh, and uh, we have made a reasonably significant uh, place in the global technology ecosystem in terms of providing innovation and solutions from the Indian private sector to the world government and the world's private sector. In 2014, when our Honorable Prime Minister uh, was voted in, he was voted in with a mandate for uh, transforming governance. And very early on, he laid out his vision of uh, embedding technology into governance uh, with the view that technology ought to be used in governance to transform people's lives and to transform governance uh, and democracy uh, in general and transform people's lives in, in specific. And in 2000, from between 2015 and 2019, in 2015, we launched something called the Digital India Program. Uh, that was over six years ago. We've made tremendous progress. Uh, we were in 2015, one of the largest unconnected countries in the world. Uh, and we are poised now to become one of the largest connected nations in the world. 
uh, over those six years, we've made tremendous progress in terms of not just connecting our uh, people uh, to the internet and uh, making more and more Indians online, but very deep structural changes into how governance uh, was delivered. Very, uh, I don't know if you are aware, but very famously in the late 80s, uh, Prime Minister of India said that out of every rupee that went from the national capital Delhi to uh, for the benefit of or to provide so social support to the uh, an Indian citizen, only 15 paise reached him, which implied that the system was leaky and there was almost 85 percent of the funds allocated to delivering governance and delivering development for an individual was lost in, in transit. Those were the that, those were the backstories to which we launched Digital India. Those were the things that we were trying to change in our governance model. And uh, I will say that over the last five years, we've made tremendous progress. And I'll give you some broad ideas of the progress that we've made. We've made progress from creating a national identities with the world's largest biometric database called the Aadhaar. We've created uh, governance and direct payment models where subsidies and pensions and government benefits are directly transmitted to millions of Indians directly without any mediation or without, without any intermediation and therefore without any leakage and corruption. Fundamental building block aspects of governance, fundamental building block aspects of uh, relationship between government and citizen have been altered uh, dramatically using technology. And so, uh, as people, you know, one one way of looking at that, at, at the use of technology, and to describe the use of technology over the last six years, is, is that the distance between the citizen and the government has been bridged tremendously uh, by technology, and that is a, a very important statement to make in a country of the size and population of India. I will say that that in the and and uh, I will say that. Those investments that were made in those six years in terms of uh, the effort in uh, governance and the effort of use in technology came to our help in this really unprecedented COVID pandemic uh, situation. And uh, never was it more evident the power of technology and the use of technology in governance working for the common citizen than during the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, where and on one end, almost 800 million Indians were given food, uh, free food for a large period of uh, during the lockdowns and the uh, duration of the pandemic. Income and pensions were being deposited directly into the accounts of people uh, during the pandemic. Income support was being given to uh, uh, people. Businesses, small businesses were being helped again using the power of technology. So I think... For the first five years, uh, I have absolutely no doubt we made tremendous difference using technology in people's lives, but really where the true impact of technology and the use of technology by government uh, was sharply visible was during the COVID pandemic. And first thing I'll say that, yes, I, I, I believe there is an expected rush of nations and corporates and individuals to digitalize themselves in the post COVID era, uh, but I will from in the Indian experience, share this with all of you and for to the larger audience watching this, that there are no shortcuts to this. Our journey has been multi-year, it has been structural, and it has ranged from connectivity on one hand uh, to embedding technology and in new in, in government processes and platforms and digital literacy on the other hand. So we've gone through the full nine yards of uh, the things that we needed to do to use technology to make uh, a difference in people's lives. I will uh, I'll just lay out a few uh, uh, benchmarks for you. Uh, connectivity, we are currently in India about uh, 800 million Indians that are online. We still have to connect 400 million Indians. And so that remains a, uh, an important challenge and an important goal for us in the coming months and years. We have launched one of the world's largest rural connectivity programs where over 400,000 villages are being wired up and connected with a broadband network. And we are building public clouds. Uh, so therefore our approach to connectivity is not just about getting online, but also having access to uh, 
cheap inefficient uh, cheap efficient uh, and effective public cloud on the digital government platform side we have moved from identity to payments to education and now and health and so the full uh, gamut of digital government experiences and digital citizen experiences are increasingly online the digital literacy uh, part that was referred to by the honorable minister of indonesia as well uh, is something that is a high priority for us and we have over 400000 centers delivering digital literacy across the country uh, as a way of empowering uh, indians who have connectivity to the internet i will quickly wrap up by saying that we see the future uh, as as being a combination of both opportunities and challenges and the opportunities are there for everybody to uh, know around the table today i think the technology represents um, the internet represents a great opportunity for every citizen and every government uh, whether it be innovation whether it's a digital economy or whether it is actually empowering citizens but also represents a great deal of challenges in terms of data governance uh, the presence of big tech the consolidation of power on the internet how do we regulate these these are all very very new uh, interesting challenges we as a nation are also in the process of uh, um, coming up with a new data protection law that because privacy is a fundamental right as uh, determined by our supreme court and therefore we have a new jurisprudence that is evolving that will address the issue of protecting citizen rights and as well as uh, encouraging innovation and investments in the to digital economy uh, i will end by saying this that india is ready to partner with all like minded nations we have built a tremendous amount of capabilities and capacity both in government and in the private sector and we are absolutely open to working with uh, all those who want to leap frog Uh, a few years of development and experience in this in this area of embedding technology into governance and building digital economies and digital governance of the future thank you very much for having me uh, thank you very much thank you very much um um sri so um i am very happy that everybody was so punctual with time and we do have questions from the floor um they are important and similar in orientation um they concern data protection and, and infrastructure for data storage for developing countries so i will ask now um two ministers to address directly because the questions came to them uh but if panelists wants to join a debate i would be very delighted with the debate um so one question is for indonesia specifically i understand indonesia has required certain types of data to be stored locally in the past uh, in your experiences did this requirement encourage foreign investors to build data centers in the country in indonesia a very similar question to sri lanka um how important do you think is it for small uh, island economies to invest in data centers in order to store and process their data how does sri lanka aim to attract fdi in this particular data center infrastructure Amelia do you want to yeah. answer the question or yes, yes. um uh, sorry minister you you would like to go first no you can go first i'll, I'll follow you yeah thank you uh so regarding to the um uh, indonesia is now uh, developing the indonesian one data and it is a kind of data center that we will build uh, because we understand that a data center is very important through digital technology and uh, uh, of course if um, there is like a opportunity for foreign investors to also build the data center in Indonesia so we are now in the process developing and to build the framework of that uh, Indonesia one data so we invite any uh, people who interest to Uh, work with indonesia thank you thank well from uh, sri lankan uh, uh, policy point of view we are in verge of uh, finalizing the data protection act uh, and also to formulate a data protection agency uh, under the under the president uh, for protection of data and we believe uh, uh, one thing is storing data but the main main aspect would be protection of the data that we store and and who is responsible authority for that i think my colleague from india can add it to more and they have 
uh, many experiences in uh, the Indian system when they initially started. So our priority is going to be finalizing the Data Protection Act and bring it to the parliament and then formulate a data protection agency. So as to the investment of data centers, of course, the government will also have its own data center, especially as the government cloud, especially for the main national data protection, data collection or data storage. But yet, yes, we are open for private sector investment as well. And we are also looking at partnering with other private organizations for data centers. So it's, it's like any other country, but we will work on our regulation and make sure that the protection of data is done from our side. And then uh, they have the regulatory bodies to be established to protect that. A very important point about legislature preceding the actual um, implementation and, and uh, economic processes. In the meantime, we received a very important question for uh, Minister Chandra Sakkar. India aims to, of, at becoming a trillion dollar digital economy very shortly by 2025. Could you please highlight the major challenges facing the country in this particular ambition? Well, uh, <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I mean, the it is more, I think we look at this more of an opportunity rather than a string of challenges. Uh, today at this current, uh, in this current year, we will export north of 200 uh, plus billion dollars of uh, technology exports, which is mainly in the software space. And we think we are uh, also focused on emerging as an electronics and technology manufacturing hub. Uh, we have a roadmap uh, to go from where we are today to a trillion dollars. That is a combination of expanding our technology services uh, part of the uh, pie the electronics manufacturing pie, and of course, the e-commerce and the, the, the software as a service part of the pie. So there is a roadmap. The challenges remain uh, challenges that are uh, challenges for anybody, which is basically to make sure that uh, foreign investors see India as a good, uh, good uh, destination to invest, grow. And these are not unusually new challenges. These are challenges that we are used to. And, we have addressed in the past. I think this is more of a, uh, the, if you ask me to say what the challenge is, in a nutshell, it is really about resetting our ambition and uh, expanding uh, our horizon in the post-COVID world to what we believe is a new definition of opportunity. The opportunities in the pre-COVID world were tempered by a very different view of the global supply chain for technology. And I think in the post-COVID world, the world sees the supply chain for technology very, very differently. And uh, uh, it is for countries like India to uh, you know, capitalize on that uh, changed view, the change focus on trust, the change focus on reliable supply chains uh, and uh, be a larger player in that. Thank you very much. Um, and indeed, post-COVID challenges are changing um, a lot of our previous concepts of economic management and governance. I think the question now would be for all three panelists, and it's about digital inclusion and inclusiveness of this new economy. Um, what are the major lessons that um, your countries have drawn and uh, um, others can replicate or learn from? how to make digital economy really inclusive in post-COVID reality. Who's first? To, uh, you, whoever goes first, I would be happy to. I, I don't okay. have any order over here. Please go ahead. Please. Yeah, please, Minister okay. Rajesh. Go okay, ahead. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I, well, thank you for letting me speak on this first. Uh, for, from our perspective, uh, from very early on, uh, we were very clear that technology was not never supposed to divide and technology must include and technology is indeed uh, the way to be more uh, inclusive in a, in a democracy like ours, which is, as you know, very, very large, uh, spread across a large geography. And for us, the mission of the use of technology and the mission of Digital India was always about bringing more and more people under the governance net that were over decades outside the net. So inclusion was almost built into the design of Digital India. And the first, uh, the raw material of that inclusion was connectivity. We saw that early on. 
uh, we've spent uh, the government has spent significant amounts of capital in ensuring that uh, india moves from being one of the largest unconnected countries to being one of the largest connected countries through a combination of wireless and broadband uh, through a combination of private investment and public investment uh, and so apart from connectivity layering on top of the public internet multiple government platforms uh, whether the range from ids to payments to health to public services that range from the very very ordinary to the very complicated uh, layering public services and platforms on top of the public internet was the other way of making sure more and more indians were included in this uh, and i i won't say more than this but excepting to say i think technology has to be inclusive and any government using technology must be driven by its mission for inclusion as the primary mission uh, than uh, the other uh, fallouts of technology which is innovation ecosystem the digital economy and so on and so forth uh, so we've done that and i think uh, uh, that is what has helped us during covid and i hope that is that is something that we will continue to do and that is i hope a model that most countries follow exactly thank you anybody else want to get to answer you want to go first or uh, i'll be the last please go ahead minister yeah I, I, i'm after you thank you so yeah i mean i i agree with a colleague from india as well i mean uh, one is uh, the people centric development based on uh, technology and and bringing people close to the government is something that we learn to use technology to, uh, uh, during the the pandemic so there are a few challenges that we face as a country one i would say to get people to use to the system you know because we are used to a certain system for a very long time so unless you uh, go through it and you get used to the system and the digitalization is people centric digitalization uh, administration is something that we are we learned during the pandemic and Uh, it has worked for us well i mean when when especially when it comes to education because earlier even though we tried to introduce technology to classroom but yet the traditional classroom that was accepted by the students and the parents but eventually with the pandemic uh, uh, it it uh, people started accepting uh, the the virtual classroom so i think this is something that we learned during the pandemic and that we can take it forward Uh, and also the digitalization has to be people centric and get people involved with it and also it's not only about the economy or the benefit or the efficiency but also to make sure that this becomes makes life more easier uh, when you go to the out, out outside the cities or when you go to rural areas of our countries you know and as i as as we all agree you know connectivity is key so one thing that we are very working very seriously and investing heavily from the government side is to connect every citizen every village uh, and and also give them uh, the literacy of technology you know it it literacy rate is moving forward reasonably in our country but we believe if we are to go for a digital id card which we are looking at uh, going at the end of the year along with e gram seva project which 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 will digitalize the entire national government service uh, along with the national id card and that will require a lot of digital literacy and connectivity in in the rural area so this is something that we are working on as as a government and we have invested and and along with that bringing out the legislation to ensure that we use the technology and we make sure that we use it for the betterment of the people and also the people user and the government and the people are all protected through legislation you know this is uh, uh, other pillar that uh, we are working on very closely with the ags department in drafting these legislations thank you very much uh, namal uh, i want to um, just reiterate that very interesting questions are coming into q and a box and to the floor but uh, mrs isabel durant is about to leave at um, 11 o'clock she has to leave us and um, i'm giving her very briefly the floor for concluding remarks yes uh, thank you anastasia and I, i don't want to use the time for question and answer because the goal of this meeting is really to exchange 
just to let you know and to thank really sincerely uh, the different minister because what you provide is really interesting, useful, especially in the perspective of the new report that we will provide on data issues and as a public good. And frankly, I appreciate a lot you, you the attention that you paid for regulation because it's true that it's nice or it's important to receive foreign investment for data center, that's really key. But in the same times, develop a real regulate, regulator framework and adapt the jurisprudence, as was said by the Sri Lankese minister, is really important. So I would like to just to tell you that it's important for us to continue the discussion with you. Yeah. It's a process. It's no endless, but really a long process. And I think that is back and forth between you experience and all reports is absolutely key. So thank you for that. We keep in touch. And yeah. I hope that uh, it could be shared on the good way with all the partners in the room. Sorry for to, to have to leave you, but I have another panel on LDC issues. So that's also related to indirectly to uh, digitalization. Thank you so much, and we keep in touch. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much, Isabel, for joining us. Um, okay, a very important question. Uh, unless Amelia wants to pick up on the previous one, can I give yeah. one direct one that actually just came uh, to Sure. Uh, I, I just would like to note that uh, digital technology is actually the very important opportunity that we have to utilize now or never, because uh, uh, once we can utilize it uh, optimally, we can ensure that a country can pursue for in more inclusive uh, economic growth. And the second one is that um, we believe in Indonesia that once we can establish the infra digital infrastructure until remote villages. Then we can ensure that the persons or people in the remote areas can be uh, connected to a wider market and they can uh, also do a better economic activities. And that can be a way for us to ensure uh, and to reduce the gap uh, between the cities and the villages. And also it is very important to ensure that people in the remote areas can engage to the market by digital technology. Thank you. Exactly. Um, so a very important last question to Indonesia um, and to Deputy Minister. Your country imposes 10% VAT on foreign providers of digital products and services. Could you please share with us the reasons for imposing this tax and the country's experience in terms of collecting this tax revenue? In this context, would you also share your views on the relevance of WTO moratorium on customs duties on electronic transmission, given that Indonesia is projected to lose significant revenue if this moratorium is renewed? Uh, the value added tax, is that, is that right? Yes, it's the 10% VAT on foreign yeah. providers of digital products and services. Your views, your, your reasons for imposing and for collecting um, tax revenue. Experience. Yeah, I, I, I think this is a part of our effort to uh, enhance uh, the, the tax base uh, in Indonesia. Uh, it's not only because we are differentiating that or we, 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 we call it that uh, we apply something different to, uh, to tax these digital products, but uh, we are actually uh, also trying to impose a kind of sugar tax, right? And, and the other types of tax. And this is basically only for uh, uh, widening the tax base of Indonesia, because as you know that the tax revenue is in Indonesia is now declining. Uh, uh, so uh, not declining the tax, uh, the 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 uh, the what do you call it the the percentage of tax to uh, GDP in Indonesia is uh, declining. So I think we need to find another sources to, uh, of taxes. But at the same time, during COVID nineteen pandemic, we also need to. A balance between which one that we need to tax and which one that we have to uh, to to uh, uh, some relaxation uh, in taxes. Uh, I think I think that is what we are now doing. Excellent. Thank you very much, and it's um, it's a very relevant answer. 
uh, to Sri Lanka to Honorable Minister of Sri Lanka, could you please share with us some more detail on the draft bill on processing of personal data? And this concerns our previous discussion on privacy and inclusion. What are the main similarities and differences between European EU data protection regulation and Sri Lanka's draft bill? Well, I mean, uh, uh, AG's department is in responsible of uh, drafting it with the expertise. And also, I must say that uh, we will be in par with what is happening in UN and what are the regulations that have been adopted uh, by regional partners. So it won't be anything extraordinary that is coming in as to data protection and data collection, uh, but it will be in par with the EU and all the rest of other uh, organizations uh, that are that has already uh, drafted these kind of uh, similar legislation. Uh, and also, um, uh, such as India, Indonesia, you know, all, all these models that they are following. So it, it, it is something that is almost similar to what is being uh, uh, used or what has, what has been passed in parliaments in many countries. Uh, but yes, it will be in par with the new generation and also uh, we are uh, looking at uh, the digital economy, digital currency, and uh, also digital banking to be established in the, in, in the long run. So the legislation based on those will be drafted separately uh, with, with the experts and, and people involved in the industry. Thank you very much, Namal. Uh, to the Indian Minister, your, your Excellence, why has your country proposed a digital tax again on uh, um, uh, equalization levy? Why, what does it aim to achieve? And this is a continued discussion of revenue and regulation. Um, I'm assuming you're, uh, you're talking about the, uh, the tax on the offshore e-commerce companies. And, yeah, probably. Uh, yeah, it, it's a question from the floor I'm reading out. Yeah. yeah. So I. And this is not unusual. I think many other uh, jurisdictions do the same. As long as the e-commerce companies are uh, owned by Indian uh, entities, uh, and even if they're offshore, there is no uh, tax uh, equalization levy that's imposed on them, uh, the 2% digital service tax. Uh, but offshore uh, e-commerce companies have to pay that. And that is not uh, tremendously unique. It is, it, it's been practiced by many, many other countries. But, uh, but even if you're an offshore e-commerce company but have a domestic presence, uh, you are exempt from that tax. Uh, it's a fairly simple proposition. Okay, that, that's very interesting. There is a question to all ministers because you all mentioned human capital or learning skill um, or um, labor challenges in one way or another. Building digital skills of existing labor force is a common challenge facing all developing countries. Can you share any specific policy which has been successfully implemented in your particular country in this particular regard? What has worked really in your view? Uh, can, can I go first? Yes, please. Yeah, okay, the, um, the Sri Lanka is uh, looking at, uh, we actually started with along with the expansion of broadband. Uh, we, uh, our, our biggest challenge was to improve the literacy rate. So along with the literacy rate, of course, then comes in the specific education based on uh, technology or IT or industrial specific uh, education. So we have partnered with uh, many organizations locally and also globally for training, uh, specific training for technology, blockchain industries, and uh, IT related as everyone is very well aware of e-commerce platform and rest of the industries. So one of the aspects that we are looking at expanding the local e-commerce industry and introducing the SMEs to integrate with the e-commerce industry in way of selling their product uh, to the local and the global market. So that is something that we are uh, seriously looking at uh, expanding and uh, uh, encouraging the SMEs to get involved. Uh, when I say SMEs, I'm talking about non-tech SMEs to be established, to be connected with the e-commerce platforms. So in that way, their product can be reached to the entire country and also if required, uh, sending it globally. So the biggest challenge I would say again, uh, the convincing the youngsters to get involved in these kind of educational programs and get them educationally qualified, qualified academically qualified, uh, to be, get engaged with the uh, e-commerce section or technology. And 
also looking at establishing back offices such as bpos and kpos to be established and then uh, shifting your mindset from a traditional employment environment in getting into a e-commerce uh, sorry getting into a bpo or a kpo uh, sector you know this is something that we are working very closely with the youth, youth council of sri lanka and also other youth organizations along with other educational organizations including citra labs and um, the microsoft and all the other partners that we are looking at expanding uh, the, the the it uh, literacy rate uh, specifically to for job creation and innovation thank you very much namal i know you need to leave in 5 minutes so i will <laughs> I will thank everybody, but I will probably give uh, the floor to your colleagues to answer this question if you still have time to be with us before. Thank you. Shri Amelia, do you want to answer the question on labor policy, in particular that has worked definitely for your country? Yeah, uh, uh, actually, we also have uh, training for uh, SMEs. to utilize and uh, the digital technology especially how that can, they can engage to the marketplace uh, electronically like uh, e-commerce marketplace uh, i think uh, this is also the same as uh, in in uh, uh, like like what minister namal rajapaksa mentioned um, the second one we have uh, a program we call it coding mom Coding Mom is uh, a training for women. Uh, 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 so we would like that women can also understand the digital technology for the basic principles, uh, because we know that we need to empower the women uh, to be able to utilize uh, digital technology better for improving their economic opportunity. So uh, I think this is one way of an uh, inclusive the inclusiveness that we also provide a wider opportunity for women to also uh, uh, this is a kind of woman literacy to digital technology uh, we also concerned with that uh, reducing the gap not uh, or reducing the, the the digital divide not only between uh, across the region but also across uh, gender men and women uh, thank you thank you very much Sure. Yeah. So I think uh, one of the, uh, and I just want to say that I'm, I'm apart from holding the portfolio of uh, information technology and electronics, I also uh, hold the portfolio of skill development and entrepreneurship, and it is something that uh, our government has recognized from uh, some years ago that skilling, uh, reskilling, and upskilling are part of almost the raw material for uh, developing the. digital governance ecosystem and so we have really broadly two very uh, uh, two pronged approach to it one is a broad digital literacy uh, uh, education and skilling program that is run through uh, a network of almost 400000 common service centers and uh, skilling centers that basically uh, give foundational digital literacy to citizens and that allows them to become much uh, faster adopters of digital technology so apart from that we also have a very specialized skilling which is outside of higher education a uh, specialized skilling network that effectively upskills those who are already in the it space or the technology space at a basic level uh, and i think post covid the demand for skilled uh, information technology talent is is tremendous uh, as more and more people even on basic micro entrepreneurship roles uh, seek out digital skills so this is something that we started in 2015 as a government uh, and it is in the post covid uh, world uh, post covid era if you want to use that phrase uh, just being uh, expanded and grown even further this is excellent thank you um, i have a very interesting question from the floor Do any of your governments set maximum prices for internet access, whether mobile data or broadband, to ensure it is actually affordable? This is a question on inclusivity and pricing. Shall I repeat? I, I, yeah, I will just uh, quickly off the bat say that India is one of the uh, cheapest uh, data 
provide. cost in the world. Uh, it is uh, uh, compared to all of the Western countries. We are a fry, we are uh, in terms of uh, you know ranges between one twentieth to one hundredth in terms of the cost of data and therefore cost of access. And so internet access and the becoming online for an average consumer in India is uh, we believe very very inexpensive compared to the rest of the world. Thank you. Um, I have a very specific question to the Indonesian Deputy Minister again. Thank you for explaining the reasons for the 10% VAT on uh, foreign providers of digital products and services. Has this tax collected significant revenue for your country? Uh, I don't have the exact uh, the exact number for that one at the moment. Let me double check for it and I'll get to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I'm very uh, delighted to to be in this company in the morning here in Geneva and afternoon, wherever you are probably in the world now. Uh, I learned several things uh, from our distinguished speakers, not only about, of course, the importance of innovation and support, um, but in terms of state management of time um, and how important it is to have this structural advantage in facilitating broadband uh, digital technology and access to your population, especially now. Uh, to me, in my previous academic experience, of course, it does have very strong echoes with the um, success of developmental states in uh, East Asia and Southeast Asia before when they implemented very targeted industrial um, competitiveness policies. So it looks like this is really a new wave of um, developmental trajectory and um, these are countries that anybody can learn from. I also um, noted that e each of you spoke about the importance of regulation and the role of the state in supporting the, not only the drive, in the innovation drive, but also the, the legislation and governance of the new economy. And it should not be really under, underestimated, especially in post-COVID realities, which are now marked um, probably by a new understanding of the relationship between the, the, the private entrepreneurship, private capital and, and public benefit. Um, so I thank each one of you uh, for your valuable time, experiences, preparation and uh, fantastic presentations. I think if we do have any more um, communication from the floor, uh, the moderators will be um, in touch with you uh, closer to uh, time convenient and of course Ankta 15. Thank you very much for your for your presence and um, have a lovely evening afternoon. And you too. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you.